Welcome back to this next video in which we are studying headaches. Okay, so we're now going to move on to another example of a disease that can give rise to a type of secondary headache, and this disease is giant cell arteritis. So some introductory comments then. Giant cell arteritis, you can abbreviate it down for short to GCA. So when you see GCA, it commonly stands for giant cell arteritis. Next, let's discuss the epidemiology of giant cell arteritis. Who does it affect most commonly and um, what's the prevalence in this subclass of the population that it affects? So, firstly, who does it affect most commonly? It most commonly affects older people. It doesn't usually affect younger people. In fact, it's extremely rare for it to affect anyone under the age of 50 years old. Uh, so the population that is affected by giant cell arteritis is people who are over the age of 50 years old. So I'll just put 50YO for years old here. So people who are over the age of 50, this is the subclass of the population that is going to be affected by giant cell arteritis. So in people who are over 50 years old, what is then the prevalence? What is your chance of developing giant cell arteritis once you get into the um, age group that is affected. Uh, so it's still an extremely rare disease, thankfully, in the population, the subclass of the population that it affects. Uh, and it's three times more common or estimated to be three times more common in women uh, compared to men. So that starts off with the prevalence in women. Uh, so the prevalence in women over the age of 50 years old is believed to be around uh, three in 20,000. So if you are a woman and uh, you make it to over 50 years of age, your chance of developing giant cell arteritis is 3 in 20,000. So low, thankfully. Uh, a little bit of simple maths then. I said it's three times more common in women over the age of 50 compared to men. Uh, so divide that number by 3 and we get a beautiful number, 1. Um, so the prevalence in men over the age of 50 is around 1 in 20,000. So uh, these are uh, the epidemiological figures with regards to giant cell arteritis. So it is a very rare disease, but when it does occur, it can give rise to a very, very severe type of secondary headache, which is why I think it's relevant to study this in the video that we're discussing headaches. Right, so I'm actually going to firstly discuss with you the pathophysiology underlying giant cell arteritis before we then go on to discuss what type of headache you actually get. I think it's better to do it that way, pathophysiology before uh, actually describing the headache and we'll build up to the headache by studying the pathophysiology. So giant cell arteritis, it's a type of autoimmune disease. So it's where the adaptive immune system is going to attack part of the body. Remember, autoimmune diseases, they're the adaptive immune system attacking part of the body and then bringing in the innate immune system, the cells of the innate immune system, macrophages and neutrophils and things like that, uh, to then attack the structure with them. Remember, the cells of the adaptive immune system are very, very powerful. They have the power to command the cells of the innate immune system. They lead the cells of the innate immune system into attacks. So in autoimmune diseases, the adaptive immune system attacks something uh, and then brings in the innate immune system cells as well. So of course the next question is it's an autoimmune attack on what? Well, it's an autoimmune attack on something that is in the walls of arteries, but we don't know what that thing is. So at present, all I can say is that it's an autoimmune attack on artery walls. So autoimmune attack on arteries. And there are certain arteries that it's most likely to affect. And these are the branches of the external carotid arteries. So not all arteries are actually affected by giant cell arteritis. The ones that are most commonly affected are the ones in the neck and head region, uh, particularly the branches of the external um, carotid artery. And there is one branch of the external carotid artery in particular that is most likely to be affected by giant cell arteritis and will be affected to the most extreme level. And that's going to be the superficial temporal artery that we've seen previously, but I'll draw a picture in a moment to remind you of where that is in case you've forgotten. So, 
first, before I discuss which arteries are going to be affected most, let's just discuss the autoimmune attack a little bit more, because there is more that I can say about it, a little bit more insight that I can give you here. So, it's an autoimmune attack on the walls of certain arteries in the body. Now, the next question you should ask is, I know something about the walls of arteries. I know that there are lots of different layers in the wall of an artery. The tunica intima, where the endothelium and the underlying connective tissue is. The tunica media, where the smooth muscle layer is. And then the tunica adventitia, where there is more connective tissue. And of course, that's where uh, the nociceptors that innervate artery walls will be present. So your next question should be, which portion of the artery wall is actually going to be affected? Is it the bit towards the inside of the lumen of the artery wall? And I'll just draw a little picture here so that I've got something to point at. So if we've got an artery here, here is its wall. It's got a very thick wall and we know there are lots of different layers of tissue making up the wall of an artery. Which portion of the artery wall is going to be affected in giant cell arteritis? Which bit is going to be attacked? The answer is it's all the different layers. The Attack can be seen in all the different layers of certain arteries, particularly this superficial temporal artery, which is one of the terminal branches of the external carotid artery. So, it's an attack that is going to attack all the different layers of the walls of the arteries that it affects. Now, I can say even more about the autoimmune attack because giant cell arteritis is actually a very fancy type of autoimmune disease. It's what we would call a granulomatous disease. So big word here, granulomatous. Now, I want to explain to you what does it mean for an immune response to be granulomatous? Uh, what is a granuloma? So granulomatous means that as part of the inflammatory response, and it's not just a um, autoimmune thing, this granulomatous is a type of inflammation, it's a type of immune response. And it's a type of immune response where you form granulomas, you form structures called granulomas. So let me just explain to you briefly what a granuloma is and what the purpose of a granuloma is. Why does the immune system create these bizarre structures? So a granuloma is a ball, okay? It's a ball of immune cells. So to draw, whoops, I need the pen. To draw a simple picture then of a granuloma, I can draw quite simply a ball like so. It's a sphere of immune cells. Now there are two major layers of the granuloma. So I'll split it into two layers here. There is the core of the granuloma. So this is the core of the granuloma. And it is the outer portion of the granuloma. So this is the outer portion. So the core is obviously at the center of the ball, and then surrounding the core is the outer layer of the granuloma. And there are different types of cells in the two different layers. So let's start with what's in the core. The core contains absolutely loads of macrophages. So let me just draw one of these. Remember, great big blobs of cells. A cell of the innate immune system. Macrophages are not a very clever part of the immune system. They're a very basic part of the immune system. Very important part of the immune system, but not a very clever part, not a specific part. Uh, so this is going to be a macrophage, and I hope you're okay with me using the abbreviation M5 for macrophage. So, this is completely out of proportion here. I've drawn a massive one. There would be absolutely loads of these. It would be tiny compared to the whole granuloma. So there would be loads and loads of macrophages stuffed in here. Now, at the center of the granuloma, right at the core, well, the core of the core, right at the center of the core of the granuloma, you're actually going to get some other types of cells here you're going to get what we call multinucleated giant cells, and this is a standard feature of granulomas. So I'm not even, well, I might actually try and draw this on here. So right at the center, you get these examples of multinucleated giant cells. So there is an example, and you can see I've put multiple nuclei, uh, multiple nuclei rather, in there. So this is a multinucleated, so multinucleated, and then giant cell. And this is a standard thing that forms in granulomas and they're formed by lots and lots of macrophages joining together to form these huge great blobs that have multiple nuclei there for because they've been formed from multiple cells. And this is why giant cell arteritis is called giant cell arteritis, because it's a granulomatous autoimmune attack. Uh, 
and therefore at the centre of the granulomas you get these multinucleated giant cells formed. Okay, so that's the core of the granuloma, loads and loads of macrophages, and right at the centre you're forming these new types of cells from macrophages joining together, which are multinucleated giant cells. What then is the outside of the granuloma? In the outside of the granuloma, there are the less vicious cells, and the macrophages, these are incredibly vicious cells, they're killers, they're incredibly good at killing pathogens, very, very dangerous cells. So in the outside, there are less vicious cells, they're not going to actually get their hands dirty, but these are the cleverer cells, the cells of the adaptive immune system, and these are the ones that are commanding the macrophages. They are shouting, screaming instructions in at the macrophages. And these are the ones that have coordinated the formation of a granuloma, and these are T cells. Specifically, they are a type of T cell known as a T helper 1 cell. Uh, which is a certain type of T helper cell. So T helper 1 cells are the type of cell that is capable of forming granulomas like this. They are a cell that is very, very good at helping macrophages. Uh, so I'm just going to write out this cell's proper name. So TH1 stands for T helper type 1 cell. So the reason T helper cells are called helper T cells is because they help other cells of the immune system. And the famous type of cell that helper T cells can help is B cells. And indeed, T helper 1 cells are capable of activating B cells. They're capable of helping in the activation of B cells. However, they're capable of doing something else as well. All the different types of helper T cells are capable of helping B cells. So T helper 1, T helper 2, T helper 17, T follicular helper, all of these different types of effector T cell, uh, effector CD4 positive T cells, they're all capable of activating or assisting in the activation of B cells. However, the different types have different functions on the side, and the function of T helper 1 cells on the side is that they can help macrophages. They can help macrophages to kill things. So, here I now need to discuss the motivation for why you form these things called granulomas. Why does the immune system ever use these things? So, this is, by the way, what a granuloma is. The core is, sorry, the sense, no, the outer layer is made up by loads and loads of T helper 1 cells around the outside, not getting their hands dirty with whatever these things at the centre are attacking, uh, but screaming instructions in at the macrophages, which are the vicious killers. Okay, so motivation then now. Why do you ever form granulomas? When does the immune system ever need to form these things? What is the point of these things? Well, a good place to look if you want motivation for granulomas is at a very, very famous, very, very deadly disease, namely the disease tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a disease caused by a bacterium, and it's usually a respiratory disease, at least at first. So in tuberculosis, there's a horrible bacterium by the name of Mycobacterium tuberculosis, but it doesn't really matter what its name is. We can just call it the tuberculosis bacterium. So in tuberculosis, you breathe in this bacterium into the lungs, and then usually when you breathe in bacteria into the lungs, what happens the immune system destroys them. There are macrophages in the lungs, in the lung parenchyma, in the alveoli called alveolar macrophages that waddle around, and if bacteria come in, they phagocytose them and destroy them. Not so with the tuberculosis bacterium, I'm afraid. Tuberculosis bacterium is incredibly good at not being killed by macrophages. The macrophages will have a good go, they'll try and phagocytose it, they'll try and destroy it, but the bacterium gets the better of them. It doesn't let them actually destroy it. So, tuberculosis bacterium, it's incredibly good at not being phagocytosed, so it's very, very difficult for the immune system to get rid of tuberculosis bacteria once they're in the lungs. So, what we do instead is we form these granulomas around TB bacteria. And the whole purpose of a granuloma is we can't actually eradicate what is inside. There is something very, very difficult to eradicate at the centre of the granuloma. We can't eradicate it, so instead what we will do is we will trap it inside this ball of immune cells that will be continuously trying to attack it um, so that it can never, ever get out of there, is the idea.
So, when you breathe in tuberculosis bacteria, the tuberculosis bacteria will start to divide and the phagocytes will try, start to try and phagocytose them, but it fails, basically. They phagocytose the TB bacteria and the TB bacteria just divide inside the phagosome. They stop the um, macrophages from being able to destroy them. So, um, it fails. Macrophages can't handle it. So, what you end up forming is these granulomas at the sites where the TB was um, actually, you know, brought into the lungs. And the whole purpose of these is to just trap the TB bacteria at the centre of the granuloma. And the TB bacteria will still be dividing here, but they'll be dividing at a very slow rate because TB does divide very slowly. And the rate at which the granuloma will succeed in destroying the TB bacteria is just about equal to the rate at which the TB bacteria will be dividing. So the whole purpose of granulomas, to summarise summarize what I've just told you, is that they trap things that we're never going to be able to actually eradicate in these bores, and they will be gradually trying to destroy whatever it is that's at the centre of the granuloma, but they can never actually completely destroy it. Uh, so granulomas trap things that can't actually be destroyed. So, that's the purpose of granulomas, to trap things that we, the immune system really is not going to actually manage to eradicate, and it will continue a continuous fight where the macrophages will be trying to destroy whatever is at the centre, and the multinucleated giant cells, these combinations of loads of macrophages, they'll also be trying to destroy whatever it is. And they will succeed to some extent, but they'll never completely eradicate what it is in here. They'll be destroying it continuously, they'll be destroying you know, members of the TB bacterium population, so some of the TB cells will be being destroyed, but they're never going to completely manage to eradicate the entire population, they'll just keep it under control. So it's to trap something in and keep a continuous warfare to keep it under control rather than to actually ever eradicate it. Granulomas generally don't ever manage to eradicate the TB bacterium from the lungs, which is why uh, once you've got TB, you never get rid of it. it. You get what's called latent TB, where you haven't actually got any symptoms, uh, but the TB bacterium is still inside your lungs. It's just it's trapped inside granulomas. So this is why tuberculosis causes latent TB, which is where you haven't got actual active TB, but you've got uh, granulomas inside the lungs that are trapping the TB in there. And if you ever get a weak immune system for whatever reason, then the granulomas will fail to control it all of a sudden, and then uh, the TB can get out of control, and then you can get active TB, which is why people who become immunosuppressed, who have latent TB, can then get active TB. Okay. So, again, let me summarise what I have now told you about granulomas. So this is the structure of granulomas. At the centre, the core of the granuloma, you have lots of macrophages, and right at the centre of the core of the granuloma, you have macrophages that have accumulated, in, that have joined together to form multinucleated giant cells. Around the outside of the core of the granuloma, you have loads of T-Hubble 1 cells that are all stimulating the macrophages to continue trying to attack whatever it is at the centre that is contained within the granuloma. Something that is putting up a very good fight will be at the centre of the granuloma, something that we are failing to actually destroy, but which we are trying to keep under control by trapping it in this ball of immune cells. So, these things are going to form in giant cell arthritis, they're going to form in the walls of the arteries that are going to be affected by giant cell arthritis, meaning that giant cell arthritis is described as a granulomatous autoimmune disease. So let me just show this on this picture here. So in our little artery then, we're now going to get granulomas forming in the walls of the affected arteries. So what this shows us is that whatever the autoimmune attack is against in giant cell arthritis. It's something that is really resistant to being destroyed. The immune system is failing to actually destroy it, and therefore it forms these granulomas to try and trap whatever it is in these balls uh, that it thinks is really dangerous, but which probably isn't very dangerous. It's probably some self thing. Okay, right. So that's what it means to say that giant cell arteritis is a granulomatous autoimmune attack on arteries. So let's now talk about which arteries are going to be most commonly affected. So I've said that it's the branches of the 
external carotid artery that are most commonly affected. So let me just remind you of the branches of the external carotid artery. So for this, let's redraw a picture of the head or the skull viewed from the left-hand side. So we're imagining we're looking at the skull from the left-hand side. We've drawn this picture before, but I'm just going to draw it again quickly. So here we are. Here is the forehead. Here is the nasal bone. Then the maxillary bone here. And then I'll put in the orbital cavity on the left-hand side, like so. And then we'll continue the skull backwards, like this, coming down here. Then we'll put in uh, the zygomatic bone here, and then the zygomatic arch, which will have a bottom that looks like this. And now the complicated bit, getting this to look right. Uh, so I'll put in the mastoid there, and then we'll have... I won't put in the styloid process, because you won't really be able to see that behind... Uh, the condyle of the uh, mandible, and then just continuing the um, zygomatic arch on here, like so, and then we'll have another little arch up there, which is where the external auditory meatus is. Okay, so just labeling things up, this is the, well, telling you what things are. This is the external acoustic meatus, or the external auditory meatus. This is where the condyle of the mandible is going to articulate with the temporal bones. So this is the temporomandibular joint. This is, of course, the zygomatic arch behind. We have the infratemporal fossa. Let's just finish up the maxillary bone here. So like so. And of course, up here you'll have uh, the lateral pterygoid plates going into the infratemporal fossa, like so. Let's put on some teeth. And again, I'm no dentist, so I'll just put these on very basically. Um, and now let's put on uh, the mandible. So here is the condyle of the mandible, the coronoid process of the mandible, the ramus of the mandible, and then, of course, the body of the mandible coming down here like so, and then let's put on the inferior row of teeth as well, like so. Okay, excellent. So there's a basic picture of the score viewed from the left-hand side, and let's now just remind ourselves of the different branches of the um, external carotid artery. So thick pen at the ready, and now I can actually put these in in red um, because it will show up nicely against the white. So the external carotid artery, remember, it is a branch of the common carotid artery, the branch that goes forward, and it comes up like so, and it will go behind the ramus of the mandible. So it will go up uh, like this, behind the ramus of the mandible, uh, and then it will go up to uh, the infratemporal fossa like so. And remember, two of the major branches that it splits into in the infratemporal fossa, it's two terminal branches, are one is the maxillary artery that will remain in the infratemporal fossa, so that will be behind the zygomatic arch there, and then one that's going to loop underneath the temporomandibular joint, like so, and then go up here over the zygomatic arch, like this. And this one's very important to me now. Uh, this is the superficial temporal artery. Before I label that up, uh, let me just put on the other major branch that I previously showed you, which is the facial artery, which comes off down here. It um, is running behind the body of the mandible, and then it will loop underneath the body of the mandible and then go up like so. So that's the facial artery. And so back to the thin pen. So the one that I'm really interested in is this one here that is the superficial temporal artery. Now I want to stress that giant cell arteritis can affect loads of different arteries. The arteries that are most commonly affected are these branches of the external carotid artery and indeed it's not just the superficial temporal artery that is affected, other ones are affected as well. But the one that is most commonly affected to the biggest level, the most extremely affected one, is the superficial temporal artery, uh, which is uh, this terminal branch of the external um, common, sorry, the external carotid artery uh, with the maxillary artery here that loops over the temporomandibular joint, superficial to the temporomandibular joint, superficial to the zygomatic arch, and then goes to supply the temporal region here. So, 
This artery is extremely commonly affected in giant cell arteritis and it's extremely badly affected in giant cell arteritis. So you get lots of granulomas forming in the wall of this superficial temporal artery. Lots of inflammation occurring in that wall. Now when inflammation occurs there, of course, I'll remind you um, that in this autoimmune attack, you're going to be getting firstly the T helper 1 cells produced against whatever the autoantigen is that is going to be attacked here in the wall of the artery. And then they will bring in the macrophages. They will come into the artery and then they will cause inflammation there and they will bring in the macrophages to form the granulomas. But this is a form of inflammation. To form these, you're going to have a huge amount of inflammatory mediators all over the place. And I should also stress that not all of the immune cells will merge into granulomas. Uh, you're also going to have loads of dotted immune cells all over the place, so loads of neutrophils and macrophages dotted all over the place. It's just some of them will aggregate then into these granulomas under the coordination of the T helper 1 cells. So you're going to get granulomatous inflammation, which means that you will get granulomas forming, but that in between the granulomas you'll have loads of inflammatory exudate and white blood cells that aren't in granulomas. Um, present as well. So really what you're getting here is loads and loads of inflammation occurring in the walls of the superficial temporal arteries and other arteries um, that are branches of the external carotid arteries. And of course when you have inflammation present that's going to trigger pain. Remember one of the major mediators uh, will be prostaglandin E2 there, a major mediator of inflammatory pain. Uh, so this is going to be produced in this site of inflammation and it will diffuse out to the, um, the um, nociceptors in the wall of the artery and activate them to fire. Histamine will also be being produced and that will um, go to the nociceptors and activate them as well. The mediators of inflammatory pain are going to activate the nociceptors in the wall of the artery and therefore trigger pain. So the superficial temporal artery, its wall will be innervated by nociceptors. Those nociceptors will be attached to primary nociceptive afferents that will enter the trigeminocervical complex through um, either the maxillary or the mandibular nerve and then it more posteriorly maybe the posterior rami of the um, fir first free cervical mixed spinal nerves. Okay, uh, And therefore it's going to activate second order neurons and it will go up um, to the contralateral primary somatosensory cortex and trigger pain. So fundamentally what I am telling you here is that when you get this autoimmune attack in the superficial temporal artery, it's going to trigger pain arising from that superficial temporal artery um, and uh, that's what's going to give rise to the headache in giant cell arteritis. So now that we've discussed the pathophysiology, uh, let's describe the actual headache that you're going to get in giant cell arteritis. So severity first, it's going to be an extremely severe headache. You get massive activation of these nociceptors that are in the wall of the superficial temporal artery and therefore it's a really, really severe headache that you're going to get. Sight. It's going to be a unilateral headache initially, but it often becomes bilateral. So this is characteristic of giant cell arteritis. If you've got a headache that was initially unilateral, but it becomes bilateral, uh, then um, you might be thinking of giant cell arteritis. And the reason in the giant cell arteritis headache, it starts unilateral and becomes bilateral, is initially it's just one of the superficial temporal arteries that is affected by the disease process, and therefore you'll just be getting pain on one side. So on our picture, we've got the left superficial temporal artery here. So if you've got giant cell arteritis affecting the wall of this left superficial temporal artery, that will initially trigger a left-sided headache. But once the disease affects then the other sided artery as well, the right superficial temporal artery, then the headache will then be experienced on both sides. So usually in giant cell arteritis, it starts with a headache on one side and then it will go into the other side as well. And of course, the region that it's going to affect is the temporal region. So a severe temporal headache that starts unilateral and then becomes bilateral. And I hope you can understand why it's going to be in the temporal region, because look, um, the superficial temporal artery is the one that's most affected, and that is in the temporal region.
Okay, and this is an extremely severe headache that you get when you activate those nociceptors in the wall of the superficial temporal artery um, because of the inflammatory process. So it's a really, really horrible headache that you get, and it will be present as long as the uh, autoimmune attack is present. Okay. So that's the type of headache that you're going to get in giant cell arthritis, and we now understand the pathophysiology that underlies that. Let's now discuss some accompanying symptoms and some major complications that can occur with giant cell arthritis, just to set the scene a little bit more. So accompanying symptoms, of course, you can get nausea and vomiting, because uh, this is a severe pain, and we understand exactly how the cerebral hemispheres, uh, when they are experiencing pain, there are pathways that are not well understood, which link them down to the vomiting center in the reticular formation of the brainstem and they can activate that vomiting center and depending on how much they activate it you'll either feel nauseous or you actually feel like vomiting and you will be sick. Okay, um, so nausea and vomiting is an accompanying symptom of giant cell arthritis. You're not going to get meningeal symptoms, and we understand why not, because this is a superficial artery. It's not a meningeal artery, uh, so it's not innervated by meningeal nociceptors. It's peripheral nociceptors, so you're not activating any meningeal nociceptors, so you're not going to get the meningeal symptoms. You're not going to get meningism. What you can get, along with the headache of giant cell arthritis, is something called jaw claudication. So I'm just going to explain what this means. So, claudication. What does claudication mean? Claudication means ischemic pain when using a muscle. So this is ischemic pain. So... Commonly, we talk about limb claudication, lower limb claudication. It's something that you can get if you have peripheral vascular disease that's commonly seen in people with poorly controlled diabetes. So in lower limb claudication, what happens is that when you're walking along, or if you're running along maybe, uh, but when you're doing exercise involving the muscles of the lower limb, what can happen is you get a horrible pain in the muscles of the lower limb that you're actually using and this pain is because the muscles now that they're being used have a higher blood demand they need more oxygen more glucose being delivered to them and um, basically the blood supply is not adequate they become um, ischemic which means is that the demand for blood that they have doesn't match the amount of blood that they're actually receiving and you get pain occurring there so claudication means that when you use a muscle, it becomes really painful because it's not getting enough blood uh, to actually meet the increased demand now that it's actually being used. So uh, that usually occurs because you've got atherosclerosis in the arteries of the lower limb. However, in giant cell arteritis, where we're affecting the arteries of the facial region, you can get jaw claudication, where you get pain in the jaw when you use the muscles of the jaw. So how does this occur? Well, I've told you about the fact that giant cell arteritis is not just going to affect the superficial temporal artery. It also affects other arteries that are branches of the external carotid artery. And some of these will be supplying the muscles of mastication, which we've been through previously, the muscles of chewing. So remember, we saw the masseter muscle, we saw the um, external pterygoid muscle and the internal pterygoid muscle, sorry, the lateral pterygoid muscle and the medial your pterygoid muscle, and we saw the temporalis muscle, those um, four muscles of mastication. I'll just remind you of where they are. The masseter muscle is from the zygomatic arch down to the external side of the mandible, like so. The uh, temporalis muscle is in the temporal region here, and it will uh, contact the coronoid process of the mandible to close the mouth. Uh, the lateral pterygoid muscle goes from the lateral aspect of the lateral pterygoid plate to the condyle of the mandible and moves the mandible forward, uh, which is important in chewing. And the medial pterygoid goes from the medial aspect of the lateral pterygoid plate uh, to the medial aspect of the ramus of the mandible and again closes the mandible. So these muscles of mastication, these are supplied by branches of the external carotid artery. Indeed, the temporalis muscle is supplied by the superficial temporal artery or, or branches from the superficial temporal artery. So what happens is when you get this inflammation occurring in the walls of these arteries, it leads to stenosis of the arteries. The arteries become narrow. They also become harder. 
So um, just going back up to my picture of the artery here, you can imagine that if you're going to get all this inflammation occurring, it will lead to the artery wall becoming much more solid and also um, the lumen actually becoming narrower. So the two things this is going to lead to, this inflammation occurring in the wall of the artery, it's going to lead to stenosis and also sclerosis which means hardening. So stenosis means narrowing of the lumen, sclerosis means hardening, so the wall is going to become sclerotic. Now, this is going to be a problem. When you are not using the muscles of mastication, then they only need a little bit of blood, and this stenotic lumen, this narrow lumen that isn't actually capable of expanding because the wall is so solid now, isn't a problem. It still supplies those muscles of mastication with enough blood and therefore you don't get a problem when you're not using the muscles. However, when you start to use the muscles, you now need the lumen to increase in size. And normally in a very healthy artery, what will happen is the artery will get bigger, it will uh, dilate. Um, to widen the lumen to increase the blood supply to the muscles. That's not part of normal physiology. When you're using muscles, you need more blood supply to those muscles, and the arteries supplying those muscles will dilate. Okay? Now that we've got a very hard wall, um, it's not going to dilate properly um, because it's much more solid. It's no longer nice and soft and elastic. Instead, it's gone quite hard. Uh, so it's not going to dilate properly and therefore you're not going to get the same dilatation of the lumen of the artery uh, that you would have got in normal physiology. And therefore you're not really going to increase the blood supply to the muscles um, that much at all. And therefore they're not going to get the amount of blood they need to um, match the amount of oxygen they uh, require now that they're working at this higher rate. Therefore, you're going to get what we call ischemia. Ischemia doesn't mean no blood supply at all. That means that the amount of blood a tissue is receiving does not match the amount that it needs to be receiving. It's a mismatch in the supply and demand of blood. So, you'll get ischemia in the muscles of mastication. What's this going to cause? What's well, going to cause pain? Now, how does it cause pain? Well, of course, if you've not got enough blood coming, then you're not getting enough oxygen coming. And that means that you're going to have to turn over to using anaerobic respiration. So just drawing a little flow diagram of where the pain comes from in ischemia. So when you've got ischemia, this means that the tissue is not receiving enough oxygen uh, for how hard it's working. Therefore, it's going to have to increase the amount of anaerobic respiration. So anaerobic respiration is going to go up. And of course, anaerobic respiration, the brilliant thing about it is it doesn't use oxygen. So not having enough oxygen is not a problem as far as anaerobic respiration is concerned. Fantastic. However, anaerobic respiration causes the buildup of a waste product, which I'm sure you know the name of, lactic acid. So anaerobic respiration produces lactic acid, and lactic acid is fundamentally an acid. It's going to donate protons away to the extracellular fluid, uh, or to the fluid generally, uh, in the tissue, and therefore the pH is going to go down. Remember, when proton concentration goes up, that corresponds to the pH going down, becoming more acidic. And when the pH of the extracellular fluid becomes more acidic, Nociceptors do not like that. Acidic tissue, not good at all. pH going down is one of the things that can activate pain neurons. So pH going down can activate nociceptors in the tissue. So it can activate the nociceptors in the muscle of muscles of mastication tissue. So allow me to go over that again. And this is, of course, what's going to lead to jaw claudication. So, when you start chewing, when you use your muscles of mastication, your jaw muscles, and this is what jaw claudication refers to, it refers to when you're chewing, getting this ischemic pain. So when you now use your muscles of mastication, their oxygen demand is going to go up, but because of the problems with the arteries now, because of this giant cell arteritis occurring in the arteries of the branches of the external cross of artery, you're not going to get an increased blood supply to those muscles, or at least you're not going to increase it enough. Therefore, you get ischemia, mismatch in the supply and the demand of uh, blood to a tissue. This means that the tissue is going to start using anaerobic respiration uh, to uh, produce energy, 
And the problem with anaerobic respiration is it leads to a buildup of lactic acid. So lactic acid is going to build up in the muscles of mastication and that's going to cause the pH in those tissues to go down and pH going down will activate the nociceptors there so you will get pain and this pain is ischemic pain. So you will then want to stop chewing because you're in so much pain and of course that pain will be felt actually in the jaw muscles where it's occurring. So that's another accompanying symptom that can accompany uh, giant cell arteritis, jaw claudication, and it's because of the damage to the arteries that are supplying the muscles of mastication by this autoimmune disease. Right, the final thing I want to say about giant cell arteritis is a major complication. Actually, now I've got two more things to say about giant cell arteritis. A major complication, which is that it can cause you to go blind, uh, and then uh, the treatment, of course. So let's now talk about how it can affect the eyes. This is what we worry about with giant cell arteritis, that it's going to now affect the arteries that supply the eyes. So we worry that it can cause something called ischemic optic neuropathy. So when giant cell arteritis occurs in arteries, we've discussed the fact that it can lead to uh, stenosis and sclerosis of those arteries. And if that occurs in the arteries that supply the eye, that can potentially lead to parts of the eye dying and therefore blindness. So ischemic optic neuropathy is a big, big uh, risk of giant cell arteritis, a major complication to be concerned about uh, with giant cell arteritis. And I just want to go over this a little bit. Right, so I've said that giant cell arteritis most commonly affects the branches of the external carotid artery, but it can also affect branches of the internal carotid arteries, in particular some of the branches of the ophthalmic arteries. So let me just remind you about the ophthalmic arteries. So remember, they come off the internal carotid artery once it has come out of the roof of the cavernous sinus and they come off before the anterior cerebral arteries come off. They will then go forward and they will go through the optic canal, remember. But remember, they do not, they leave the uh, meninges before they go through the optic canal. They don't go through the optic canal within the meningeal sheath that lines the optic nerve. So they penetrate out of the outer meninges and then they go through the optic canal and will get into uh, the orbital cavity. So let me just remind you of the different branches of the ophthalmic artery. So I'll do this on the right hand side then again. So here is a picture of the orbital cavity viewed from above, a picture that we have drawn previously. Uh, and here of course is the orbit like so, uh, oh, and, um, oh, well, sorry, that's the globe, the eye, of course. And, of course, uh, you'll have the optic nerve going in here, and I'll just draw in the optic nerve, and that will be covered, of course, by its meningeal sheath, but I'll just draw it like that. So, thick pen at the ready, then. Let's now draw uh, the branches of the ophthalmic artery. So here comes the ophthalmic artery, like so. And of course, one of the first branches of the ophthalmic artery is the central retinal artery that runs through the middle of the optic nerve, like so, penetrates through the meningeal sheath that covers the optic nerve, penetrates through the actual nervous tissue and runs in that canal down the middle of the optic nerve to get into the eyeball and it will supply the retina. But remember, that is not the major thing that actually supplies the um, optic nerve. Usually, in ischemic optic neuropathy, it's the optic nerve that is actually damaged by lack of blood supply, rather than the actual retina being damaged by lack of blood supply. So I'm going to show you the two major arteries that actually supply uh, the optic nerve with blood, because these ones uh, getting giant cell arteritis in them is what commonly causes uh, you to go blind by damaging those portions of the optic nerve that they supply. Okay, so let's carry on our picture. Uh, so we've still got the thick pen. Um, so here is the ophthalmic nerve. And of course, one of the branches it will give off is the lacrimal, sorry, not the ophthalmic nerve, the ophthalmic artery. One of the branches it will give off is the lacrimal artery that will go over like so. And then it will continue on forwards like this. And I'll just remind you of the branches that I've already told you about of the ophthalmic artery. So I told you that there was a supraorbital branch that goes through the supraorbital foramen and then uh, comes out on the forehead and will supply the forehead. 
I also told you that there was an anterior ethmoidal branch of the ophthalmic artery, and I'll just put that in here. So remember, the ophthalmic artery continues on forwards, and then it gives off an anterior ethmoidal branch that will go through the anterior ethmoidal foramen up into the olfactory groove. And remember, that gives off the anterior meningeal artery uh, and then goes through, uh, again, the nasal slit to supply the nasal mucosa. And then the rest of the olfactory, uh, sorry, ophthalmic artery will go forwards and become the supratrochlear artery. So just to uh, go over what I've put on here, here is the actual ophthalmic artery giving off the lacrimal branch here. It continues on forward, gives off the supraorbital branch, continues on forward again to become the supratrochlear um, branch here, and then gives off the anterior moidal branch right at the front there. And remember, the first branch was the central retinal artery. So... Some more branches that I now want to talk about are the branches that are actually going to supply the optic nerve. And these are branches that come off the lacrimal artery and also directly off the ophthalmic artery. So firstly, the branch that comes off the lacrimal artery. So that is a branch here, which is actually going to go into, and let me just um, get rid of that line I've managed to put in there. And I'll also get rid of this blue dot at the same time. Okay, so back to the arteries. So there's a branch here that comes off the lacrimal artery, which is going to penetrate through the sclera and is actually going to supply the eyeball with blood. And that's called the long ciliary artery, or the long posterior ciliary artery, excuse me. Uh, so I've just put on the long posterior ciliary artery. And I'll go back to using my abbreviation for artery. So long posterior ciliary artery. So that's that branch coming off the uh, lacrimal artery here. And that, as I say, is going to penetrate the sclera and then run in the space between the sclera and the choroid and supply the eyeball. But it also gives off branches that will go and supply the optic nerve, branches that will penetrate through the meningeal sheath and supply the optic nerve with blood. Now, uh, bear in mind that my picture is a little bit wrong in that these branches are actually given off much further backwards. So imagine that everything's a little bit further backwards so that this long posterior artery, um, long posterior ciliary artery is going to be running alongside the optic nerve for a much greater distance and therefore is actually going to be supplying branches to the optic nerve for a much uh, longer time. There's another uh, posterior ciliary artery called the short posterior ciliary artery that comes off at the ophthalmic artery directly in this position here. So that other one is called the short posterior ciliary artery. And again, that's going to penetrate through the sclera and supply uh, the eyeball. It will run in the space between the sclera and the choroid and supply the uh, eyeball with blood. Now, um, before it gets into uh, the eyeball, however, it will be, again, giving branches off to the optic nerve. So the optic nerve is supplied by these two arteries, the long posterior ciliary artery and the short posterior ciliary artery. And again, remember what I've just said, that these are actually, although my picture shows them only supplying the very anterior portion of the optic nerve, imagine that all of these arteries that I put on are a bit further back, which indeed they are, uh, and then the long posterior ciliary artery and the short posterior ciliary artery will be running alongside the optic nerve for more time and therefore will be able to supply more of its length with blood. So we've seen these two arteries that are majorly involved in supplying the optic nerve with blood. Remember the central retinal artery that majorly supplies the retina. It gives off a few branches to the optic nerve uh, but it isn't the major blood supply to the optic nerve. Now, if you get giant cell arteritis occurring in these arteries, the arteries that supply the optic nerve, or indeed in the arteries that supply them, so if you've got uh, giant cell arteritis affecting the actual ophthalmic artery, of course, that will affect all of the ones downstream. Um, but if you will get giant cell arteritis just occurring in these long posterior ciliary arteries and the short posterior ciliary artery, um, then that can hugely affect the blood supply to the optic nerve and this can cause what we call ischemic optic neuropathy where the optic nerve does not receive enough blood and then starts to die and that can cause loss of vision. So it can firstly lead to blindness in one eye and then it can spread to the other eye as the arteries in the other side are affected as well. 
so this is a major, major thing to be concerned about if someone has giant cell arthritis, that it might be affecting the arteries that supply the eye uh, and the optic nerve and then leading to ischemic optic neuropathy. Now, the final thing just to say about ischemic optic neuropathy is that we often divide ischemic optic neuropathy into two. We divide it into anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, abbreviated down to AION, and then posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, PION. Now, what's the difference between anterior ischemic optic neuropathy and posterior ischemic optic neuropathy? In anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, it affects a more anterior portion of the optic nerve, and in posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, it affects a more posterior portion of the optic nerve. Now, that's obvious. What's the purpose in the difference? Why has someone actually, you know, come up with these definitions? Because if the ischemic optic neuropathy affects a very anterior portion of the optic nerve, this portion here, then it can lead to a sign on ophthalmoscopy. Indeed, it can lead to optic disc swelling when you um, examine the optic disc with a thunderscope. So anterior ischemic optic neuropathy causes optic disc swelling, whereas posterior ischemic optic neuropathy doesn't cause optic disc swelling. And so let me just talk you through the pathology here. If you get a very anterior portion of the optic nerve dying due to lack of blood supply, i.e. you get anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, when that dies, of course, you're going to get inflammation occurring there. Whenever you get dying tissue, it triggers inflammation. Death is very, very bad. The body assumes that when things are dying, it means that there's a pathogen present, and therefore inflammation is needed. We need cells of the immune system. We need proteins from the blood to attack the pathogen. And therefore, you will get inflammation occurring at the site where the optic nerve uh, axons have died, and if that's very anterior, it will actually be visible, that inflammation will be visible with the thunderscope, and therefore you'll get optic disc swelling, as we discussed uh, when we were discussing papilledema, but then uh, the swelling for papilledema was uh, caused by something different, but it will be, it will look the same, i.e. no longer will you have a smooth boundary of the optic disc, it'll be ragged and cloudy looking, it won't be well defined anymore. Okay, so this can cause unilateral optic disc swelling, and you would not refer to unilateral optic disc swelling caused by anterior ischemic optic neuropathy as papilledema. Remember, papilledema was bilateral optic disc swelling caused by intracranial hypertension. So when you get posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, because that's further back, again, you'll still get inflammation occurring because of the dying axons further back, but you won't actually get a swollen optic disc. So that's the reason that people came up with these two different definitions, because if, you, if you're going blind and you've got optic disc swelling in that eye, then we can refer to that as anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, whereas if you're going blind but you don't have optic disc swelling, that must be affecting a more posterior portion of the optic nerve, so we call that posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Okay, so that's the difference between anterior and posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, and that's how giant cell arthritis can cause this major complication. And I'll repeat again that it really can cause you to go blind, firstly in one eye and then in the next eye, just as the disease moves between the uh, arteries on the different sides. So, uh, finally, let me just say what the treatment for uh, giant cell arthritis is. So the treatment for giant cell arthritis is glucocorticoids. So treatment for GCA, giant cell arthritis, is the glucocorticoids. And hopefully you can recite off the names of the glucocorticoids that I previously gave you when we were discussing cluster headaches. Uh, so remember, we talked about prednisone, which is a prodrug for prednisolone converted in the liver. You can give prednisolone directly. Uh, you can give methylprednisolone, an analogue of prednisolone. You can give dexamethasone, triamcinolone, uh, and you can give hydrocortisone. Those were the six examples of glucocorticoids I gave you previously. And remember, they go into cells all over the body and they change gene expression. Now, why do we give glucocorticoids for autoimmune diseases such as giant cell arthritis? Because they cause 
an anti-inflammatory effect. They stop the production of inflammatory mediators that bring in uh, inflammatory cells into tissues, and they also suppress the immune system. They stop the activation of T cells and B cells. They go into T cells and B cells and stop their activation. So glucocorticoids have both an anti-inflammatory effect, which means they stop the inflammatory response, and an immunosuppressant effect, which means that they stop the activation of the adaptive immune system. So they have an anti-inflammatory effect and an immunosuppressant effect, and obviously both of those are desirable in an um, in autoimmune condition where we're getting the adaptive immune system triggering inflammation. The anti-inflammatory effect will bring down the inflammation and the immunosuppressant effect will stop the continuous activation of the adaptive immune system that's actually causing uh, the inflammation in the first place. So glucocorticoids are very effective at reducing the autoimmune attack on the walls of the arteries. So let me just summarise what we have seen about giant cell arteritis for you and then we'll have a break and in the final video we'll discuss glaucoma. So giant cell arteritis, it commonly affects people over the age of 50 years old. It's three times more common in women compared to men, but it is a very rare disease even in people over the age of 50. Um, it's three in 20,000 women approximately and whilst it's one in 20,000 men are affected. It is an autoimmune attack on something that is present within the walls of the arteries and what that autoantigen is we do not know. However, whatever it is, it's putting up a pretty good fight because the type of autoimmune attack that you get is a granulomatous attack. And granulomas are usually formed when we can't actually destroy something. They're formed around things where we just want to trap that thing somewhere in the body and stop it spreading. Uh, and we can't actually ever get rid of it, but we can control its population at least within a granuloma. But the granuloma won't usually ever succeed in actually eradicating that permanently. And the classic example of this is tuberculosis, where usually people do not ever manage to get rid of the bacterium. They instead get latent TB, which means in their lungs they have granulomas that are continuously fighting to maintain the uh, tuberculosis bacterium population under control. And if you ever become immunosuppressed, the granulomas become weak and then the TB bacterium uh, becomes out of control and you get full-blown TB. Okay, but indeed, uh, a third of the world's population is believed to have latent TB, i.e. we have this time bomb in our lungs. Uh, and if our immune systems ever become weak, too weak to maintain the granulomas, uh, then it will come out of control and we'll get the full-blown disease, which isn't a nice thought. Okay, but anyway, we're not talking about TB, we're just using that as an example to justify what granulomatous warfare is all about. So it's all about trapping something that we can't actually succeed in destroying. So whatever it is that this autoimmune attack is attacking, it's finding it very, very difficult to destroy it. Uh, the macrophages are not finding it easy to destroy. They're continuously receiving encouragement from the T helper 1 cells that are trying to make them destroy it, giving them the powers to use all of the mechanisms that they have to try and destroy it. Uh, and indeed, they even fuse into these things called multinucleated giant cells, which is why the whole thing is called giant cell arteritis. Inflammation of the arteries is obviously what's meant by arteritis, and because there are these multinucleated giant cells, it's called giant cell arteritis. We then discussed which arteries are most commonly affected, and it's the branches of the external uh, carotid arteries, uh, in particular the superficial temporal arteries. Now, when the inflammation occurs in the walls of the superficial temporal arteries, of course, that is going to activate the nociceptors in the walls of the superficial temporal arteries, and that gives rise to the headache. Now, initially, when it's just one side that's affected, so the superficial temporal artery on one side of the head that's affected, then you will get a unilateral temporal headache that is extremely severe. But as the superficial temporal artery on the other side becomes affected, then of course it will become bilateral. Accompanying symptoms with the headache, of course, you can get nausea and vomiting, but you can also get jaw claudication, which means that when you actually try and chew, when you try and use the uh, muscles of mastication, 
uh, that it becomes really, really painful. And this, remember, is because these damaged arteries are now losing the ability to actually increase the blood supply to the muscles of mastication when we're actually using them uh, during chewing because they become sclerotic due to the inflammatory process that is affecting their walls. Uh, and therefore, um, you get ischemia in the muscles of mastication when you're actually using them, when you're chewing, and this leads to a buildup of lactic acid, which causes pain. And then finally, we discussed a major complication of giant cell arteritis, which is that it can affect the arteries that supply the optic nerves, uh, and therefore can lead to parts of the optic nerve dying and therefore can lead to you going blind. Uh, and we split ischemic optic neuropathy into these two different types, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy where you'll get optic disc swelling and posterior ischemic optic neuropathy where you won't get optic disc swelling. And remember the reason you get optic disc swelling is that when the uh, arteries die due to lack of blood supply that will cause an inflammatory response. Remember the blood supply won't have been completely annihilated. The will still be some blood coming through. You might wonder how do you get an inflammatory response if there's no blood supply? Because of course the inflammatory response comes from the blood. Uh, but there will still be some blood supply, it's just not enough and therefore cells are starting to die. So uh, you get an inflammatory response where the cells have died um, and uh, this, if it's right at the front, will lead to optic disc swelling when examined with thunderscope. Um, but if it's more towards the back, then it won't lead to optic disc swelling. So that's posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Finally, uh, again, that blindness, usually it will affect just one side and then it will go to the other side. Finally, the treatment for giant cell arteritis is glucocorticoids, which have both an anti-inflammatory effect and an immunosuppressant effect. Um, so they will stop the actual inflammatory process from occurring. They'll stop the production of inflammatory mediators and therefore stop more blood cells, white blood cells coming into uh, the walls of the arteries. Uh, but they will also stop the actual autoimmune activation of the adaptive immune response that is driving the inflammatory response to attack the arteries in the first place. Uh, so they're going to attack it in those two ways. So we'll end this video here. In the next video, we will discuss glaucoma and then that will be the end of the video on headaches.